Right, thank you very much for um, signing up and attending this um, uh, side event. I'm Felix Dodds. I was the executive director for Stakeholder Forum from 1992 to 2012. I'm now an adjunct professor at the Water Institute of the University of North Carolina. <clears throat> As you know, this is a pop-up side event. Unlike uh, pop-up restaurants or cafes, we can only offer you food for thought not real food or for that matter coffee. Uh, the reason for deciding to arrange the event uh, was the decision uh, that any reform of the high level political forum has been put off until uh, 2021. That was, decision was taken after the side event deadline had passed. Uh, we do apologize to those who wish to attend uh, the VNR session that is going on now, but uh, it is recorded as this will be too. I would ask you to uh, thank uh, our speakers and respondents for coming on at uh, such short notice. Uh, the objective um, of the event is to raise some questions on is the present high-level political forum fit for purpose? To do that, we've asked two people to present <clears throat> and to give uh, uh, the discussion some ideas. We're very fortunate to have in them and the respondents people who played a significant role in Rio Plus 20, the negotiations for the Sustainable Development Goals, and the creation of the High Level Political Forum. Let me introduce our speakers first. Our first speaker will be Mohamed uh, Khalid, who is, the, is a Sustainable Development and Climate Change Senior Expert and former G77 and China Lead Coordinator and Negotiator for Institutional Framework for Sustainable Development during the Rio Plus 20 process and just beyond. He will be followed by Jan Gustav Strandenus, who's a senior advisor on governance for S Stakeholder Forum and who was active for Rio Plus 20 in the creation of the high level political forum. <clears throat> After that two speakers, we have three respondents. Our first is Paolo uh, Caballero, who's now the rare managing director for climate and water, but she was previously director for economic, social and environmental affairs in the ministry of Foreign Affairs of Colombia, where she spearheaded and helped shape the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And for those who do not know it, it was Colombia who with Guatemala um, and at times Peru and the uh, United Arab Emirates, who were the first countries to propose the Sustainable Development Goals. Our second respondent will be Albert Batar, who is Rwanda's former Minister of Energy and Water and was the co-chair of the 2011 German Nexus Conference, feeding into Rio Plus 20. Our final respondent will be Marianne Weisham, who is a senior associate at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, and who has written extensively on the high-level political forum and uh, governance issues. We will then be open for questions, and if you put your questions into the question and answer button at the bottom or comments then we'll come to those after that the event will finish at 11 30. i'd ask you if you're not on mute to do so we have charles newhan who's the chair of stakeholder forum supporting our logistics today uh, but without further ado can i ask mohammed to unmute if he's muted and uh, you have the floor mohammed uh thanks felix uh can you hear me i can yeah. Uh, thanks, Felix, and uh, good morning to all, or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are right now. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to, to be um, among this distinguished uh, panelists and lead experts, many of whom are, uh, used, uh, are very good friends of mine, starting with yourself, Felix, and as well, Paula, of course, the champion and the mother of the SDGs, uh, this is how we used to, to call her uh, in the UN time. Jan Gustav, of course, and Marianne all are acknowledged for their work on sustainable development and the institutional framework of sustainable development. Um, uh, as, as you rightly mentioned, it's true that uh, this uh, uh, side event or webinar was set up in a, in a record <laughs> time 
And um, it didn't took me more than two seconds to accept because I was interested by the matter. First of all, because this is a subject that is really dear to my heart. I've been working on that. And as you rightly mentioned, I used to be the G77 and China lead coordinator and negotiator of the resolution 67 to 90 that established the HLPF. But also for another reason that uh, since Rio plus 20, I thought that the idea of uh, a council for sustainable development uh, has become off the table. And um, while uh, observing the efforts going on for reviewing the HLPF and ECOSOC, uh, again, I, uh, I can't by notice that the, the idea is still absent and the efforts of reviewing are really more uh, about the functions and the mandates and activities of the HLPF rather really than the structure or, or, or the form. So it is very interesting to bring it back to uh, the foreground uh, once again and to put it on the table for discussion and to, to examine it because uh, I think uh, as you rightly mentioned it it has been always kind of in in the back mind even though if it was not really uh, in the debate. Um, my uh, my uh, presentation or evidence is going to be brief and it's going to uh, be mainly about the historical aspect of the idea of the council, what happened, why we didn't achieve it, uh, emphasizing the political underlying because I think it played a, a major role in, 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 in getting to where we are now. And uh, it will continue to do so in my in my uh, uh, in my view uh, in my view. Um, so to start with, um, I think it is important first to um, point out the uh, whole uh, environment and circumstances that surrounded. The, 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 the idea, we were speaking about the preparation for Rio Plus 20 uh, conference, which was revolutionary in my view, uh, in the sense that it was not uh, following the usual UN major conference that we just try to uh, follow up the progress and see where we are. No, the, the Rio Plus 20 conference, it was more about taking a pause and saying that uh, things are not going right, we need to change course. And I think this is the revolutionary part of Rio Plus 20. And this is how we, um, the, the results of the conference included really um, uh, 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 landmark uh, 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 outcomes. The SDGs, of course, the new generation of development goals the uh, agenda, the post-2015 development agenda, which is now Agenda 2030. And as well, along with this old thinking and vision, it was important to, to, to acknowledge that we need an institutional framework that would deliver and would cater for this vision. And this is where we started to debate which institutional framework. Um, before the conference, there were many views and many ideas floating and diversion as well. And uh, this is when we start to focus more on the idea of form uh, follows function. Uh, since we couldn't settle really on what different form could be the, the most appropriate. Uh, having said that, the functions that uh, were identified back then uh, where the integration of the three dimensions of sustainable development, this was a major shortcoming of the CSD. So of course it, it, it was just logical that the issue of integration of the three dimension of sustainable development would come really at the top of the list of what we need to uh, see as a, as a functional mandate of the new um, institutional uh, uh, structure. Uh, the implementation, this was the uh, second priority, the implementation of uh, sustainable development commitments and agreements. And the third one was the uh, coherence and coordination and avoiding duplication and overlap. 
the force was attracting the uh, high level decision makers and uh, having influential discussions with the IFIs, international financial institutions and multilateral development banks. And the final was the agenda setting and uh, science policy interface. So basically, while we were struggling with uh, getting to a form that everyone would agree on uh, and structures that everyone would agree on, we at least had an agreement more or less on what are the, the functions that should be delivered. Uh, then, um, I believe an important milestone was uh, solo meetings that took part in Indonesia in uh, July uh, 2011 before the Rio Plus 20 conference because this is where really the idea of the Sustainable uh, Development Council uh, was uh, put on the table uh, in, a meaning, in a meaningful way and in an effective way so that it would be part of the discussion and part of the debate. And by the way, this is the same meeting as well when uh, Paula presented the proposal for the SDGs. Um, and of course, since the, the birth of the, the, uh, the idea, there were a major controversy around it. Uh, the rationale behind was to follow suit of the, more or less, of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council, before becoming a council, was a functional commission uh, depending on the uh, uh, ECOSOC, like exactly the CSD. And despite that ECOSOC and the GA were dealing with uh, issues related to human rights, this did not prevent from uh, turning the uh, uh, Human Rights Commission into a council. So the rationale was to follow suit of the Human Rights Council, since there are lots of similarities between uh, uh, this case and the case for uh, sustainable development. Um, but of course, the fear from the idea of the council were related to uh, that this would constitute an application to ECOSOC, uh, and this would uh, threaten and weaken and marginalize as well ECOSOC. Uh, and the counter idea, or uh, let's say the other option was strengthening ECOSOC so that it can, uh, it can do the job. Uh, but one of the backgrounds for that was that uh, the ECOSOC agenda was so wide and overburdened. And the, uh, when we were discussing at, 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 uh, at that time, we were trying really to uh, set up a home for sustainable development within the UN uh, by just addressing the shortcomings of the CSD and trying to, 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 to go further. Um, I have to say in this regard that the concern of um, the application uh, with the ECOSOC, it's a real one and it's a valid one and I think it's still a major uh, issue that we need to consider when we are uh, debating the idea of, of the council. Because uh, unlike the situation for the Human Rights Council, it's true that ECOSOC was dealing with human rights issue, but in the case of sustainable development, lots of the um, um, economic and social aspect of the sustainable development are being dealt with really with ECOSOC. And, uh, during the extensive meetings and negotiations at that time, we couldn't come up with how to address that, how to address this concern. So I think the concern, it's, it's real and it's valid. Uh, so in, uh, in, in view of the uh, diversion that we had up till the, the conference, we couldn't agree on either or the compromise that we managed to achieve uh, in Rio Plus 20 conference was to establish the HLPF and the conference, uh, since we didn't have the time to agree really on the details and uh, form and structure of it, the conference uh, delegated this to a GE process afterwards. So in uh, contemplating the uh, history of the idea of the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Council, we have to differentiate between before the Rio Plus 20 conference and after the Rio Plus 20 conference. 
after the plus 20 conference there is no council on the table we couldn't agree on the idea we agreed to establish the hlpf and the fight afterwards became not whether we establish a council or not but whether the hlpf is going to be an institution or not this became the, the new struggle afterwards in the negotiations uh, and the um, uh, consideration uh, afterwards. The uh, G77 and China uh, position back then was more lenient toward uh, having the HLPF as an institution uh, because it stressed that uh, it should have the power of decision making, and this was really the controversial, the major controversial point in the negotiation whether the HLPF can adopt decisions or not. And this has remained to, to the last minute. Um, and also, the uh, G77 at that time questioned um, if the HLPF is going to be under ECOSOC. Uh, this is going to be contradictory with the uh, universal uh, aspect of the HLPF because we know that the, the ECOSOC membership, it, it's limited, it's not universal. So since the vision of the group of 77 and China was that it should be an institution, it should adopt a decision, the question or contradiction was how uh, the uh, HLPF with its universal membership is going to adopt decision that needs to be re-examined and re-verified again at ECOSOC with uh, limited membership. Uh, the compromise was to have the HLPF uh, that we're having now, uh, which is the hybrid, uh, which meaning that it is it can convene under the ECOSOC and under the GA as well. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't manage to uh, get the power of decision making because, as I said, this was really uh, the instrumental uh, issue whether the HLPF would be considered as an institution or not. And the compromise was to uh, have the ministerial declaration and the double adoption that you're all aware of that it is adopted first. Uh, in the HLPF and then the report of the HLPF, including the recent declaration, it's adopted again in the uh, ECOSOC was to address uh, uh, this uh, issue. Uh, so the compromise was to have the uh, ministerial declaration instead of the um, right, uh, giving the right and the capacity of the HLPF to, to, to decide. Uh, and as well to give a window for review because this was a first time to create such hybrid uh, arrangement and we didn't know how it's going to work. That's why we created a window of uh, regular review for HLPF so that during the, the, its course we can uh, rectify or readdress the uh, um, uh, as I said, the uh, political underlines were uh, very strong and uh, I do believe that uh, it is the reason, the main reason why we, 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 we didn't really either achieve uh, or establish a um, Sustainable Development Council nor to make the HLPF as a real institution. Um, and I, uh, I remember at that time that one of the argument that was put forward to uh, uh, promote for the vision of the current HLPF from one of the delegation of a major country, I don't want to mention the name for the time being, but I believe you can all think of, uh, was that uh, let's have a Davos on the Hudson. And this is how he described the, the, the structures that we would like to achieve. So not really um, an institution, but sort of a meeting, a forum uh, to attract high level people. Uh, and uh, as uh, uh, outlined, it's a kind of a, a, a David on, on the Hudson, which is very similar to what, what the, the HLPF is, is doing right now, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So um, uh, basically, these uh, are the uh, historical evolution of, uh, from the negotiation perspective at that time, 
uh, how we came from the idea of the CSD, uh, sorry, of the Sustainable Development Council to the HRPF. Um, the, my, my last uh, point that I would like to conclude with is that I, I, I spoke about the history, about what happened. I think it is important to take into consideration, consideration the, the present, what is happening now, and uh, the UN today is not the UN when it used to be in 2015 or 2012. Uh, the UN today is fully mobilized behind the agenda for sustainable development at the highest level. The Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohammed, is supervising herself uh, the uh, progress and implementation of the agenda and with the new uh, development system uh, reform within the UN, the whole UN system, whether at the UN level, at the headquarter level or at the country level or regional level, it's totally, totally mobilized behind achieving the SDGs and Agenda 2030. So I think this is an important aspect as well that we need to, to take into consideration in our discussion today. Thank you, Felix, and thank you all for, for listening. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And I think understanding where we've come from um, helps us to look where we might go. And I think that was a really important, in a, in a sense, bedrock to, to, to the conversation today. And I think your final points were just so much um, worth reflecting on for all of us, which is, the, the whole system is now supporting sustainable development, which wasn't the case when the advocates for a stronger body were there. And therefore, I think the, the open discussion, which again, uh, thank you to the member states for creating a space where we might review the, the progress. And of course, the high level political forum was created before we agreed the 2030 agenda. So it's not only appropriate that we should review whether the institution that was created for something that had yet to be negotiated is the exact type of um, institution that, um, that we need to have. And that leads in very much to Jan Gustav and Jan Gustav's presentation. I'm assuming Charles is still with us. And there we are. Uh, Jan Gustav, you have the floor. Remember to unmute yourself. There we are. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix. And thank you also, uh, Mohammed, for your, uh, your introduction and, and uh, recalling the historical background for uh, for um, <clears throat> the development of, of uh, the thoughts around sustainable development institutions. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Um, we, have, um, we have called this uh, presentation, uh, is there a need for a council? And we want to ask the questions. And uh, um, it's interesting to see that, uh, that we are on historical good grounds. 75 years ago, almost to the day, the United Nations was founded in San Francisco. And uh, uh, it is with the, the solid foundation of knowledge and history that we actually can say that uh, the council idea is founded. Uh, looking back and reading the comments and the discussions back in San Francisco is very much the same in content as we find today. They talk about the urgency of implementation, and they talk about the need to safeguard the well-being of the people, including the planet, although the, the planet was definitely different in 1945 than it is today. And the same was reflected last year at the Summit on Sustainable Development in September at UN headquarters. The political declaration speaks about the urgency to implement and uh, the, uh, the, the state leaders that were present, including all the older representatives from the 193 countries agreed to call this decade, we're just beginning, for an action of decade to implement the 2030 agenda. Can I have the next slide, please? So it is with this uh, historical background and well-founded situation that we now go into the future and we can look at the future with some interesting ideas. Um, back in, in, in 1987, the 
former Norwegian Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brunton introduced sustainable development on the political agenda. It was at the time not a new concept, but it was the first time it was on the political agenda. And it's interesting for me as a historian to remember the discussions and the papers and the books written at the time. A scientist would say there's too much politics in the concept, and the politicians and delegates would say it's too much science in the, in the um, concept. And they were all agreed on one thing, sustainable development will soon disappear as a concept. Well, it's here and it's developed. And it was affirmed through four very major summits and each of the summit gave us an institution with which to work. We got the Commission on Sustainable Development, and as Mohammed has, has uh, shown us, we got the HLPF in, in 2013. It was actually established in Rio, but given its mandate and marching orders a year later in the resolution 67-290. Can I have the next slide, please? Also re reiterate what Mohammed said, and, uh, and uh, the solar meeting was very interesting and important because uh, Paola Caballero introduced the SDGs to the world and to the ideas that we need to develop. But also the solar message is very, very clear on emphasizing the need to have a council for sustainable development. So two important things were happening in 2011. And one has come into fruition in a, in a, in a way we could not have anticipated back then. The other is still waiting for its fruition. Could I have the next slide, please? So the presentation aims to show that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development needs a strong institution because the 2030 Agenda today has become, I would say, too large for a forum or a platform to handle. It demands uh, a, an institution with, with vast resources, not like the forum has. It must have a, a solid home within the UN. Um, we also know that struggling for many, many years, uh, believing in, again, in, in a few interesting reports from the UN, uh, sustainable development has reached political legitimacy. And we need an institution with strong uh, framework to be the transform transformative change uh, institution that we are talking about within the 2030 agenda. Uh, the next slide, please. So, there is a growing need for the UN to do more. And as we polemically say a bit later, building back better, but not regress. Next, please. Um, an interesting question to ask, at least from my point of view, has the HL been successful in implementing its mandate? Which begs the question, what is the mandate? And is the mandate the same today in, as, as it is, was in 2012 or in 2015? Uh, are the mandates and tasks increasing, becoming more serious and challenging? And if so, are our institutions fit for purpose and do they f do forms follow functions? And as I said earlier, building back better but not regress. Next, please. The original mandates for the entire 2030 Agenda Works are primarily defined in three documents. 67 to 90, which gives the format for the HLPF, Resolution 71, which is transforming our world, the constitutional document for the 2030 agenda. And in 2016, we got 70 to 99, which is the follow up a review of the 2030 agenda, which then mapped out four or five years of, of agendas. Next, please. Now, from my point of view, we've done a review of only the tasks and mandates we find in 67 to 90. And there are, all, there are actually 19 identified tasks for HLPF to perform only in that resolution. And we've done this um, going through it with uh, maybe uh, an inter interesting to provoke thoughts, giving the value, have, has the HLPF fulfilled over these four or five years or not? And as you see in the in the right column, we have given a grading for that, from not really to perhaps or ne negligible or improving to yes, it has. And unfortunately, the fulfillment grading is less than the increased development. Uh, I will not comment each of them because they are available, but uh, definitely um, uh, we have not. We had we've had follow-up and reviews. We've not had a negotiated political outcome 
because that is negotiated before HLPF take place. Next, please. This is just following up on the rest of the, the identified tasks and obligations and mandates you find in 67 to 90. And again, to my mind, it doesn't really show that uh, positive response we should need. It has been extremely successful in, in reviewing the, the, um, the uh, uh, national implementation of, of uh, STDs, and we got some brilliantly developed through the Secretariat VNRs, as we all know. But the question is, has it gone far enough? The next, please. <clears throat> the number of mandates pertaining to HLPF, which is found in the three documents that I mentioned, amounts to more than 30. Uh, and they're here referenced in paragraphs. And if I could have the next uh, slide, please. As we also see, the 2030 agenda knowledge is expanding almost daily, at least on an annual basis. We've chosen to call this the Global 2030 Sustainable Development Portfolio. And the left-hand column points to what's agreed and operationalized since 2012 within the framework of the 2030 agenda. We've got the SDGs, the targets, the review indicators. We've got 67 to 90, as we said. We have the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, the Paris Climate Agreement. We have the Sendai Outcome Documents, Samoa Pathway, and a lot of relevant work done by UNDP, GASOC, uh, CBD, and other UN institutions and specialized agencies. The sustainable development, as explicitly shown through the 2030 Agenda, has, as Mohammed said, penetrated the entire UN system and even gone further. But there's so much more coming up in this decade. To be followed on the right column, we have just highlighted a few of them, perhaps most institu institutionally important. The World Data Forum, which is focusing on the 2030 agenda, with meetings in 21, 23, 25, and 27. We still have the annual HLPF reviews, the national and regional reviews, the high-level meetings, 23 and 27 the indicators the reviews this year in 24 and 28. Annual finals for development forums, we'll come back to that in a little while. The UNIP in, uh, scientific reports on the environment, the environment assemblies, and the next assembly to take place February next year, as scheduled, if nothing happens with the pandemic, will be dealing with how to develop and implement the environment to fulfill the SDGs. We have the GSDR, which has developed an interesting set of challenges through science. And we have General Assembly resolutions on sustainable development, including ECOSOC deliberations on sustainability. It is growing. Next, please. So the question again, <clears throat> does the present institution have an adequate position? Does it have the strength, the resources to find a way forward for the 2030 agenda? And to fulfill the political declaration which was agreed to last year? Well, that's a question, success or failure. Next, please. Before we go on, there is an interesting thing. Those of you who have been with the UN uh, for a number of years, and we've all been privileged to do that, when the delegates are pushed to a challenge, they respond with wisdom and political savviness. Often we forget the, the uh, introductory statements, the, uh, the, the, uh, the profiling, the resolutions. And this is a very, very interesting one from 67 to 90. It is in the preambular text and refers to 84 and 87, or 85 of the re-outcome document, which establishes the HLPF. And it refers to 67 to 90 in, in uh, content, but it says very clearly, and I will read it, emphasizing the need for improved and more effective institutional framework for sustainable development should be guided by specific functions required and mandates involved and address shortcomings of the current system, take into account all relevant implications, promote synergies and coherence, seek to avoid duplication, eliminate unnecessary overlaps, reduce administrative burdens, and build on existing arrangements. In this preambular text, we have everything we need. And it's an interesting reminder that we need to keep uh, alive. Next, please. 
So there is a difference. Is there a difference between a council and a forum? Well, we try to list some of the main points. To the left, we have what HLPF is in broad strokes. And to the right, we say, perhaps the council could have the following. We know the HLPF, we could quickly run through it. It is directed by the presidents of ECOSOC or UNJ, universal membership, yes. It has no bureau, no real decision-making powers works with general references to UNDESA in terms of the secretariat. It has a very short limited time, eight days only. The preparatory process through the internet, deliveries of SDGs and receive BNRs from countries on certain goals, drafted report ministerial declaration before the HLPF, and has his selected input by stakeholders. Now the council, reflecting the growing complexity and workload of the 2030 agenda, could have maybe an assistant secretary general leading a well-resourced secretariat. Of course, universal membership, a bureau with decision-making powers and a president of the bureau leading the policies, a negotiated agenda that could quickly respond to current and emerging issues. We need a well-resourced secretariat, work continually on an annual basis and be mandated to coordinate sustainable development for the entire UN system. This could be this, and of course more. Could we have the next, please? The next slide, please. <clears throat> so the question is, do we need a council? Well, again, a question. Nations are upgrading all over the world, the SDGs, and it's upgraded also to a very high level politically. Several countries have the coordination of, of the 2030 agenda at the state leaders level. An ASG at a council secretariat could carry more authority to respond to this. The portfolio, as we have mentioned a number of times, is growing fast and demands a well-resourced institution working continually on this. New regulations are coming in also within finance. We will return to that in a second. And the question is, are the nations and the regions outrunning the UN in, term, in trying to be a lead on, on the 2030 agenda? Council could be mandated to have the authority to work on coherence. Could be in a position, a council could be in a position to direct implementation throughout the system. When the Green New Deals, financial directives and investments, this is where actually we see uh, a possibility for the council and ECOSOC to work together, carrying and protecting the integrity of the two ones, possibly so. And it could be in a better position with, to work with important stakeholders. The next, please, slide. So <clears throat> the next slide, please. What would the relationship between the council and the UN look like? This is what touched upon by Mohammed, and it's extremely important because back in 2012, we did not address this po probably uh, in, in, in a good way, but it could be an institution at the highest level. It could work to absorb the work of ECOSOC on the second committee on the UN General Assembly it needs to be developed. We need some modalities, but it's not impossible. The two councils can meet on issues with, with the economy and finance. This was originally uh, a very strong mandate for uh, ECOSOC to coordinate the, the IFIs. And the discussion around uh, finance and ECOSOC has actually not really developed. The last time a real analysis was done on this was in the late 80s by Erskine Childers. So, Again, we need to do work, but there is a way to find a way to coordinate the two ones. We have the quadrennial comprehensive policy review of the UN system. Operational activities could be dealt with by ECOSOC with recommendations on sustainability issues to the SD Council. The specialized agencies report to ECOSOC, but it could again be found a way to deal with this uh, and the SD issues put to the Council. And the council could have space to address focus areas, such as, for instance, the Sendai disaster reduction. And it could be an interface with the um, multilateral environmental agreements. And I think on this area, we will see more of those in the years to come. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> the next, please. Other benefits could be that a, a heavyweight council could be actually the institution to engender the transformative change. Identify gaps, decide on time relevant agendas, 
for instance, absorb the antibiotic resistance, or as we say in the next bullet point, respond immediately to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you had a negotiated agenda done by a, a, a bureau, this could be done on a relevant basis support relevant partnerships, seek quantification of their contribution, work with UNEP and, and as I said, the MEA's conventions and rights issues. It could be a forum where, where we review local and sub-national governments and uh, be a proper forum for stakeholders to discuss with member states on the delivery of the 2030 agenda. It could upgrade regional issues, which is there now, but not focused enough. And it could be, um, an institution to coordinate and integrate out or all outcomes from the ongoing 2030 sustainable development portfolio. The last one is extremely important because as I've said, and as Mohammed has pointed to, this portfolio is now inside every element of the UN and it's growing fast, complexity is growing, and we need to deal with this with a, a strong institution. And the next slide, please. The next, please. And that is it for me, with a smile and an optimistic uh, attitude towards the future. We can actually work on this and make the implementation come through to 2030. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Angus. And I hope that uh, people will find the presentation useful for their own um, reflections. It'll go up on the uh, stakeholder forum website so you'll have access to download it and use it as a discussion within your own governments or um, uh, stakeholder group uh, as will uh, the video. So we've had the historical perspective, we've had Jan Gustav try and in a sense put some questions on the table. We have three amazing respondents and I'm going to ask Paula to be the first and if she could unmute herself you have the floor. Hi, everybody. Um, greetings around the world and thanks to everybody who's joining and to Felix and everybody else for inviting us. It's amazing to be on a panel with such good friends. Um, I'm going to be a little bit provocative, uh, so um, bear with me because I think these are important issues, but we have to really push hard on the boundaries. So there's two words that matter to me these days. Um, one is relevance and the other is actionable. How is this going to be relevant to the world outside of the UN bubble and how is it going to be actionable? Because otherwise, you know, what's the point of it? We talk about fit for purpose and there's a lot of people at the UN that are enamored of this phrase. What purpose? Um, I think uh, Jean Gustave has just outlined some, some important benefits, but I don't think that a council could do all of them. Is it going to manage the SD portfolio? I think that's important function, but that's certainly very different than advancing a green and inclusive economy. And I really question whether a council can do that. And I think history shows that it actually cannot. Um, so I think we have to be, um, we have to be ambitious, but we also have to be um, much more gra ground truth, what it is that, that we're after. What is the impact that we're after? And to me, the question is, are we, how are you moving the needle and are you moving it fast enough? Um, Jean Gustave just said something, I, I hope I'm not taking it out of context, about nations outrunning the UN. Well, God bless them. I hope everybody outruns the UN. But then the question is, what is the relevance of the UN in helping that marathon that we are under? So um, a couple of, of points related to that. One is local. Local is where decisions happen, where synergies, where trade-offs, where the whole spiel, you know. And local can be a local authority. It also can be a lever plant or a poultry processing plant. I mean, local is where things happen. And I really don't understand yet how the UN can, can peter down to that level and support that. Um, Felix, we had a, a bit of a conversation before that started and you've pointed out to over 600, 6,000 multi-stakeholder partnerships to deliver SDGs, uh, UNDP national investment forums to help investor fund SDGs moved by sovereign wealth funds, all of that is, is frightfully important. And I think that what the UN has to do is in a way, one, get out of the way, <clears throat> but then look at this huge portfolio of, of initiatives and really figure out what is the purpose there? Because I don't think that that's very clear yet. The second is related to climate change. Nobody's mentioned climate change. To me, they're one and the same. I mean, I could have given a 10 minute introduction explaining why the two shall never talk to each other within the UN. Um, but I think after Paris, and especially where we are right now, it's, it's more and more of a mute point. I was obsessed last year to have one summit for SDGs and climate be one. 
as I said, you know, in the UN, I understand why the two cannot talk to each other, but in the real world, it's absurd. And the same thing here, this cannot be sustainable development and then, you know, COP26 or whatever happening on the side. It's one agenda. Where's climate in all of this? And there's a lot of movements there in terms of the finance sector, in terms of alignment of climate risk portfolios, the task force on climate disclosure. You know, there's so much happening on the climate front and making sure that the two come together should be for, uh, first and foremost and not have the UN continue to treat them differently just because they were you know, adopted by different parents. Um, they're siblings. I mean, they're, they're Siamese twins at this point. Um, in terms of, of some of, of the way forwards, to me, red lines would be no bureau. Um, the bureau for Rio plus 20 actually um, was not, didn't even have the SDGs on the radar until the very end. And actually, in many ways, as far as I understand, I wasn't on it, opposed the SDGs because, you know, it was going against the prescribed norms that had been agreed to in Resolution XX. Um, you don't get transformation through bureaus. You don't get transformation through negotiated agendas. Um, resourcing the secretariat for what? Again, fit for purpose. What are you going to create a secretariat for to do what? More bureaucracy? Bureaucracy upon bureaucracy? I, I just, I'm not really sure that that's the, the way to go. The relevance of the VNRs. Yes, there, you know, there's a lot of good stuff around the VNRs, but you go to countries, you go to the field and you ask people about VNRs for that matter, SDGs, and nobody has a clue what you're talking about. So again, what is the relevance? And what is the relevance of all of this to the UN reform itself? There's huge efforts, you know, the RESREP system has been transformed. There's, there's huge changes in the UN already. And there's no way a council is going to bring coherence to the UN. There's too many com uh, conflicts and, and tensions within the UN, as we all know. So the question is, how do, you, how do you sort that? So let me just close by saying that I do think that there's a huge role in terms of new partnerships around emerging areas and particularly around linkages. COVID has shown linkages galore, linkages. Let's not forget this is a universal agenda. Look at what's happening with COVID in places like the US. Um, this isn't about helping developing countries do development. It's about development writ large, and everybody's a part of it. Sweden did not do such a great job on the COVID response. You know, we need to understand that all development is relevant for everybody. We said that in the SDGs. And finally, I think that the, the SDGs were relevant because they were clear and they were sticky. Stickiness is the last bit I'll leave you. If you're going to do a, a council or a governance structure or something, make it sticky so that it's relevant to the rest of the world. Because otherwise, we're just going to be within this, you know, sound chamber that we all, you know, inhabit. All of us on this panel have inhabited for years. Um, and we keep trying to talk about how to get out of the UN or the climate or whatever bubble. This is really an opportunity for building maybe something from outside the bubble in. Um, and I think that that is the, 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 the challenge. And fundamentally, we need to align the finance sector and investments because if we don't do that, um, there's no way that we really are going to be able to deliver on this agenda. So again, thank you for, for having me here. Um, I can't stay until the end of the panel, but I'll stay for a bit longer. And I thank you so much for having me. Thanks very much. And I think um, for those with long memories, the, um, the CBD and the UNFCCC at one point was reporting to the Commission on Sustainable Development for the yeah. first five years. It was an integrated agenda. And then it started diverging. And I remember having a conversation with uh, Tarek Benuri back in, uh, I think, 2009 or 10. And he said, we made a mistake at the beginning of the UNFCCC. We should have done what ultimately became the SDGs in the sense of the, it shouldn't have been a framework convention, but it should have been ones which addressed the different sectors and the interlinkages between those sectors. And that we lost the opportunity of creating coalitions of the willing under each of those while we focused on the target being negotiated and not the actual work that needed to be done. And I think that echoes a little bit of what you just said, I think. Uh, thank you very much. We're going to ask Albert. Uh, if, Albert, could you unmute and um, give, us your, give us your input? So oh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. And uh, this is really a very important discussion we are having at this side event during the high level political forum. So as Felix said, I was Minister of Energy Communication and Water in Rwanda prior to Rio plus 20. 
I also had the pleasure of co-chairing the German government 2011 Nexus Conference with the OCI, who happened to be Minister responsible for uh, development cooperation and also a very long time parliamentarian. Uh, perhaps even I uh, had not realized how important the agenda of that conference was going to turn out to be. In many ways, the Nexus conference was the first place where the issue of interlinkages between issues, in this case, water, food and energy, had a real profile leading into a critical uh, UN summit, Rio Plus 20. It is now eight years since Rio Plus 20 and nearly five years since the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was agreed to. I here have two key reflections which may be relevant to the discussion today and the excellent presentations made. The first point is unsurprisingly on the issue of nexus or interlinkages between the goals and targets. Last year's sustainable development report produced by an independent group of 15 scientists explained that, and I quote, we stand at crossroads of continuing to tick boxes, the SDG targets, or choosing a more systematic approach that multiplies the effects. This is something that has become so much clearer to a larger group of policymakers, especially with the present pandemic. Building back better here, a theme we have here, and that has to be through the SDGs and the implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement. It is also clear that sustainable development will not come about by an accidental compromise among sectors. We need a deliberate uh, specific focus on making the best use of co-benefits to accelerate broad progress where we can to deliberately avoid negative trade-offs. What this means is that we can just carry on looking at sectors, in, sectors we can not just carry on looking at sectors in silo. We need time and space to look at the interlinkages. It is clear from the presentation so far that we don't have that timetable at the UN, neither in most countries at the national or local level. It takes a huge refocusing of policymakers and other stakeholders to move to a systems approach. It cannot be achieved by just adding a day here or there. We need space in the UN agenda and uh, debatable, but I think perhaps a council might give it the right political status for this to happen. Ultimately, it needs to help deliver better action at the local and national level and this brings me to my second point, which is implementation and accountability. Are the commitments made by heads of state being delivered at the local and national level? In too many places, they are not. The pandemic may make this even less likely. In too many places, people have not had of the sustainable development goals, or they have not interpreted them rightly. The agreement that member states would produce voluntary national reports on their implementation of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs has been more successful than you expected at the time. But there is no real accountability and not enough peer review by other countries. That there are have been over 200 reports since 2016 is to be commended, but we need them to be more robust and more transparent about our progress, but also more honest about the challenges they are facing. To end, I just like to remind us, we have around 10 years according to the IPCC report before it's too late on climate change. It has always been that the link between the 23rd agenda and the critical conventions on climate change and biodiversity are intrinsically linked. If we want to hit the climate target and address the loss of biodiversity, the road map is through delivering the SDGs at the local and national level. Post my ministerial engagement, it is now about 11 years I have been spent, have been spent Moving from a country to a country, you know the five economic blocks of the African continent, much involved in assisting the governments in developing their 
sustainable energy strategies, the climate change policies and strategies, as well as the, developing, the development of the NDCs in response not only to Paris Agreement commitments, but also ensuring the alignment to the requirements of the SDGs. I can tell you that going this usual normal, we still have a long way to go. This is the true picture on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albert. And um, I think um, that's under, it, it supports a lot of what Paolo was saying and what uh, Mohammed and, um, and Jan Gustav uh, are saying. Uh, could I have the, la the last presentation from Marianne? So if you could unmute and um, could other speakers just uh, mute themselves? Right. Thank you very much, Felix, for having me. Although I promise to be the skeptical person here. Um, so all protocols observed uh, to save time. I have three points. And I would like to start with agreement. Uh, actually, thanks for these presentations. I have heard many things I agree with. You hear me, Felix? Yeah, OK. Um, and I am a political scientist, so I do believe in the power of institutions. They are relevant, or at least they can be relevant, Paula, <laughs> as we all know. Um, and actually, back then, in, in, I just looked it up in March 2011, uh, we drafted a paper and suggested to have a Sustainable Development Council, and we saw three options for it. Uh, back then, we said the best option would be actually to reorganize ECOSOC itself, to give it full membership and to broaden its mandate and uh, its focus on sustainable development. The second option was back then that we discussed to revitalize and reorient the trusteeship council. And the third one was to upgrade CSD. And that's what we got. Uh, that's what we got at Rio Plus 20, the HLPF. And yes, I fully agree, uh, the HLPF outgrew its form set up in 2013, as you said, before uh, we got uh, the 2030 agenda and the SDGs and its form can no longer fulfill all these functions. It can no longer follow functions and it's not fit for purpose. And for me, the fit for purpose relevance it should have is to answer the question, how do we get there? How do we achieve the SDGs? How, what are these actions that Paula mentioned to achieve the real transformation with a particular focus on the interlinkages as the GSDR also outlined last year? Uh, at the same time, as Mohammed and, and also Jan Gustav pointed out, indeed, nowadays, almost all of the UN works on the SDGs. Uh, but at the same time, it's a bit strange that the HIPF is really not in a position to uh, then orchestrate this in, in any way. So yes, it would be a good time to reflect the format of the HIPF and maybe even go beyond, you know, think about the division of labor within the UN system at large, looking also at the General Assembly, the ECOSOC, even the Security Council. But now my second point is the skeptical one. Um, you know, we are in a situation of multiple crises. It's not only the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the crisis of multilateralism that we are in. Let's just take one minute to reflect what happened during the last few days and weeks. We have a major pandemic and the US decides to leave WHO. We have a major humanitarian crisis in Syria and there's no consensus in the, Sir in the Security Council to extend you know, a purely humanitarian resolution on cross-border access for humanitarian support. We have a looming climate, climate crisis and there's no consensus on mentioning decarbonization or green recovery in any UN documents. And most relevant for our discussion, of course, um, since February, we have ongoing negotiations on the review of the HLPF. Because back then in 2016, in the resolution Jan Gustav mentioned, 7299, member states agreed to review the HLPF after its first full cycle. And last year, in the political declaration, they said it's one of the 10 action points in that political declaration. We want to strengthen the HLPF. Yet, if you look at the negotiations, and I followed them quite closely, G77 China says we don't envision a total overhaul, just a few adjustments. And the US says 
Well, for us, this is not an accountability mechanism. There are too many duplications with, you know, the second committee in the General Assembly, uh, with ECOSOC, the integration segment and the high level segment of ECOSOC. Uh, Mohammed mentioned that this is a valid concern, of course. Um, everything should stay fully voluntary. We don't want any standardization of uh, the voluntary national reviews, so no rules for the VNRs. The ministerial declaration that Jan Gustav mentioned should remain a consensus document, pre-negotiated. Um, if not, skip it altogether. Some countries want to skip it altogether. And, you know, a consensus document has its problems. We see it this year. The ministerial declaration is to be adopted on Wednesday and we do not yet have a consensus document today. So, um, it will be very weak. We have uh, conflicts around stakeholder participation. Um, you know, uh, the HLPF is known to be very strong on stakeholder participation and a few member states want to go back on that. Uh, in terms of financing, the old conflicts are all back on the agenda, whether it's the link to FFD and the means of implementation or whether it is the discussion around any program budget implementations implications that is member states are not willing to invest in strengthening the hlpf with more days better preparatory or follow-up processes or to support or to better um, invest in the support structure that is UNDESA and, and others so you know that frustrates me i have to say <laughs> and there are many more conflicts around the themes and the clustering how to best deal with the interlinkages and as mohammed pointed out in the very beginning in fact in and indeed it's, it is still the case that the relation to ecosoc is is one of the major problems as it is one of the principal charter bodies uh, and and so still the whole question how is is the HRPF related to ECOSOC is um, a problem and that's why member states actually said that the two reviews of ECOSOC and of HRPF should be in close conjunction but then again G77 China insists on two separate resolutions and the reasoning is because of the different mandates and objectives of the two bodies and or the two institutions and that is in my view another sign that there's a, another big hidden conflict and that might be the elephant in the room, the old one between development and sustainable development. You know, we still did not overcome this, maybe. So to conclude with my third, more optimistic point, you know, as I started, I think institutions have, diff, diff, have important enabling functions. And I think we have to take all these concerns, these positions and these politics into account. We need to closely analyze them and then convince member states why and how it would be in their best interest to upgrade and invest into a better governance for the 2030 agenda and SDGs at the United Nations. But I remain not skeptical, but I want us to be cautious because you know, this might not be the best of all times and we might not be in the age of wisdom yet. So uh, be careful to open a Pandora box uh, and you know what happens when you open it. So I don't need to explain. Thank you. So very good food for thought. Um, what I would just, to give you a little bit more optimism, I would take you back to 2007 and 2008. And you're saying that things are bad now, and they clearly are. In 2000, 2007 and 2008, we had a huge financial crisis. We had the first failure of the Commission on Sustainable Development discussing climate change and energy. And Brazil decided to take a lead during what could clearly be the, a, a terrible time to try and move an agenda forward. But they did in, I think it was uh, September 2008, get G77 support for a new summit on sustainable development and slowly built. And I guess what I'm saying is we're also in that same crisis position. And sometimes it is actually the best time to start to articulate um, 
where the problems are, what we can do, and to start to get people to believe again. And it may very well be, depending on the US election, there is more space for optimism next year or pessimism, depending on, uh, on your perspective. But if it is optimism, then wouldn't it be good to have something available that could actually potentially address that? Now, what I'm going to do uh, is, before taking some questions is just allow um, the other people, uh, particularly the two speakers, to come if they want to come back on what they heard from the respondents. So, Mohammed, do you have any comments on what you've heard? Uh, thanks, Felix. No, frankly speaking, I'm, I'm in, a, in, a, in an agreement with, uh, with much of, of, of not all what have been said. I appreciate as well um, Paula uh, and, and David to, to link us to the what's happening on the ground. And this is a very important and very valid point, of course. I, and I totally agree with her provocative <laughs> perspective it's true the issue of relevance and actionable needs to be emphasized needs to be thoroughly examined and needs to be really uh, considered and i think this should be the, really the prism from which we should be uh, presenting or advocating the idea i i totally agree this should be the prism really yeah yeah gustav do you have any comments i just uh, just, just quickly, um, uh, I, um, I will, uh, I will say that, uh, as, as Mohammed also said, uh, that uh, Paula were able, to, were able to, Paula was able to point to, to a number of issues that we need to address. We wanted to open a, a discussion into the future to create a narrative for uh, for a discussion on what Mariana referred to as the governance issues and I think also that Albert referred to the interlinkages which I do not believe is properly addressed and and uh, and the interlinkages can be I think better in, uh, addressed at an institution and uh, and as Mariana Baisheim said that uh, that uh, the institutions do have enabling functions and I think we should not lose that so so um, I, I do think that uh, the bureaucracy that we have when it's functioning well is is an a cement in 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 building institutions um i think also a council could be an incubator uh and it should be a leader a political leader globally and and uh, that that was my comment in relationship to nations uh, uh, you know being far ahead of the uh, of the un system uh, just one more comment. I think the climate issue is important, but I do believe that climate must be connected to the other elements because uh, the climate is not sustainable development. Sustainable is part, is uh, com em embracing everything. And just a quick point to those who I see also comments raising the issue of the Pandora's box. And as Mar Mariana said, we would have to be difficult, uh, careful in opening the Pandora's box. I just want to remind everybody that the last box of the Pandora's boxes is the box of hope. So um, we could open that one as well. Uh, th thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna to go to the questions in the, um, uh, in the Q and A uh, area, but what I'd also say is that I think um, we're in a situation where um, opportunity is here for us to review this. And I'm not aware, and maybe, uh, when people come back in after I read out a few questions, that anyone else is seriously trying to, in a sense, expand the conversation about what we could look forward to for, for a fit for purpose um, organization in the sense of a, of a conversation. And so, you know, the objective of this is to see if there's any space for that. And then if there is, to try and design something that might be useful. So just moving to the Q&A section. Um, oh, on the Pandora box, just to point out that the Pandora box is about to open anyway, because there is a conversation going on about the 23 targets um, in the SDGs, which fall in 2020 or 2025. And there is, I don't, I haven't looked at the final resolution, but there was a discussion about not this year's P, uh, um, UNGA, but next year's UNGA, looking at what comes out of uh, the CBD and the SICOM process and how though those re 
visited targets would fit into a um, uh, the, the, the SDG process. So the Pandora box may open and we may have to pull back all those delegates who created the Pandora box, including Mohammed, um, for those targets in 2020 and 2025 and sorted out. Anyway, uh, one of the questions is um, th that um, should, how do we link the establishment of sustainable development multi-stakeholder councils at the national, sub-national level so that they can uh, take up the implementation of the targets um, uh, and so that we get big roots. So that's from uh, Loy, that's one of the questions. Rob Wheeler asks, um, what is needed and can be done through UN sustainability processes to get all countries to adopt ambitious and detailed action plans at the local to national level? So it's a similar issue to truly uh, support and implement such things as the 10-year framework for uh, sustainable production and uh, consumption and the global plan on education for sustainable development. And I'll take a third one. Um, let's have a look. Uh, I think some of these we can answer uh, singularly because it's they're not more for, uh, for uh, the people. Um, So then the third question is, how can we uh, involve regional organizations? And it, uh, they're talking about Asan and, and others better in the process. So those three, if we take those three first, and then I'll move on to the next set. So maybe, uh, Marianne, if you could start. Sorry, Felix, I missed the, the last one. Which was the last the, the, one? Uh, involving how can regional organizations play a better role basically in the process right okay let me start with that one um, um, Mohammed might remember that during the negotiations that was also a difficult point because uh, there were different views as to how to best use the regional organization some like to work with their regional organizations other not so much I personally think a lot has happened and in, in specifically this HLPF this year, I feel that you can see that the regional organizations really developed quite good ideas and initiatives how to be complementary to what the HLPF is doing, how to help with the preparatory process. And actually what they do is quite diverse. So what, what they do in Latin America is different from what they do in different parts of Asia, in Europe or in Africa, and that is a good thing. I think it shouldn't be a blueprint, but rather they should react to what is most relevant. And I mean, what they all should do in my view, nevertheless, is to uh, work on the transboundary issues in the region, because we don't have another forum that could possibly deal with that. So, you know, managing transboundary rivers, for example, or uh, border areas, uh, yeah, biodiversity issues in, in, in border areas, stuff like that. Um, the national level, I mean, is key. That, that was clear even back then in 2011, 12, 13, when we discussed the HRPF, and that's why, you know, we all came up with this idea to have a review system, a follow-up and review system that also works with national reviews. And that worked quite well. For me, this is the success story of the HRPF. Uh, so many countries volunteer to do this. And of course, you can discuss the quality of, of the reviews and reports. But nevertheless, um, I think it's a big success that so many countries uh, decided to go for the VNRs. And in that context, um, localized or nationalized the SDGs. They came up, they revamped their national development strategies or in, in my country, the sustainability strategy, they made it more international. They expanded it to cover all 17 SDGs and to work with the principles of the 2030 agenda. So that helped a lot and it changed a lot. So I think we are doing pretty well on that one. Um, but of course, there's not enough time to accommodate all the requests. So we need to work on that to get a better quality. And now specifically for the second time reporting to make it also more reflexive and, you know, in a, in a learning loop 
to, to have better learning happening here. Um, in general, I just wanted to say, as for the Pandora box, I didn't think of the SDGs, that's bad enough, maybe, but of the UN Charter. You know, if you would reorganize ECOSOC and, and say, okay, we need a broader mandate in terms of sustainable development, you would need to open the Charter, and that is the Pandora box I mentioned. And also, as for the strategy, I mean, I personally, when I, I started working on the HIPF review, I thought, you know, go for a backdoor revolution, uh, look at the working methods within the given mandate and twist and tweak a little bit, but that didn't really work out well. So maybe, you know, we, we want to create transition and maybe we also need a great vision on, on how to reform the UN for that. We open a major battleground, but maybe it's worthwhile, let's see. Um, and last but not least, because I don't know whether I'm on again, uh, let's not only preach to the converted. We had nice cozy discussions last year on the HIPF review, but when the negotiations, the intergovernmental negotiations started this year, the discourse changed. And, and I think we need to start uh, talking with the skeptics and with those people who you know, have these reservations earlier on in order to, to you know, get a broader discourse that then is also relevant in the negotiations. Thanks. Thank you. Albert, do you have any reflections? Unmute yourself. Unmute. Uh, unmute. Ma uh, Albert, you're muted. I, I can unmute you, I think. Um. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, that's brilliant. Yeah, so I, I wanted to build on what Mariana said uh, on the importance of uh, uh, regional organizations and uh, taking reference uh, to the uh, African continent right now. Um, uh, the discussion, the agenda is uh, really uh, like on top of priorities uh, on how uh, cross-border uh, uh, regional uh, considerations in different uh, sectors. Uh, right now, for example, in the uh, question of energy, we are busy working on uh, the African single electricity market. And uh, to be able to achieve that, uh, a number of uh, uh, parameters needs to, to need to be looked onto. Uh, things like uh, technical standards, legal regulatory frameworks, uh, issues of uh, tariffs, and uh, with uh, water supplies will be the same, all meant to facilitate trade, uh, knowledge exchange, uh, and uh, building on uh, achieving a number of uh, all these uh, SDGs at different levels. So organizations, uh, not only African Union Commission, but uh, also other uh, uh, agencies, uh, regional power pools, uh, for example, uh, Association of African Utilities of Regulators, uh, for example, uh, and other political organizations that are looking at uh, migration and uh, other uh, aspects that uh, are necessary to the uh, life of uh, the people are uh, key and very active and I can see uh, what is happening. And of course, you follow, for example, the African continent uh, free trade area uh, to be able to achieve that. That is all going uh, not only to uh, uh, assist uh, on, on trade, but this trade means uh, also achieving a number of uh, uh, different uh, uh, SDGs in their own uh, ways, if you look at, look, at, look at it. And this is something that is technically positive and uh, really encourages a number of uh, political attention. Uh, also beyond the continent, opening also ways and doors also to uh, uh, foreign uh, interventions in terms of uh, uh, trade, in terms of partnerships. And uh, I believe uh, this is going to contribute a lot to the achievement of the SDGs. Thank you. Mohammed. do you have any reflections? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, very briefly, I, uh, I would like to echo what uh, Maria just said, uh, just speaking on the point of the uh, regional level and, and regional commission, it's true, this was one of the controversial issues during the negotiations of uh, HLPF. At some point, even some countries didn't want to see any role at all for the regional commission, and at some point it was really that there was a concern that is going to be off the table completely, and, and we fought for that. 
And luckily that we did. Why? Because um, in the review process now of the HRPF, one of the uh, concerns or uh, critiques addressed to the HRPF is the issue of disconnect. That there is a disconnect between the HRPF and what is happening on the country level. And I have to say that uh, after leaving New York, I've been involved in uh, works of the regional commissions. And I have to say the regional commissions uh, are closer to the country than the HRPF. They understand more the uh, country, they understand more the challenges, they're really closer to them. And it's true, if you are speaking about disconnect, this is the important role of the regional commission that they are playing, that they're linking between the international level and the, the, the local or national level. Uh, the second comment I want to make, the philosophy of the recent uh, UN development system reform is the philosophy behind it that the sustainable development, the SDGs, is going to happen in the country. It's going to happen at the country level. So instead of waiting for the countries to come to us, we will go to the countries, we will equip the countries, we will strengthen the UN teams in the countries so that they will be better prepared to achieve SDGs and sustainable development. And I think this needs to, to be examined while we are considering this issue. Is it really this is the case? The SDGs and sustainable development is going to happen on the country level. Then what is the role then of the international level? It's going to be only normative, supportive, uh, and uh, exchange and lessons learning. I think we need to reflect on, on, on that as well while we are considering this issue. Thank you, Felix. Yeah, stop. Yes, thank you, Felix. Um, um, I think uh, um, I think the the points have been raised by by my esteemed colleagues here. Uh, uh, something that I completely relate to. Just let me uh, a, a, a few comments on that. First of all, I'd like to say um, also um, uh, not as a political scientist but as a historian that I do believe in the role of good institutions and uh, and as I see the uh, the institutions around uh, around um, uh, the sustainable development uh, uh, 2030 agenda including possibly a council is that it could be an incubator for for progress i don't think we would have been talking about uh, the 2030 agenda in every country in the world had it not been for the un and for for the un desa uh, the secretary that supports hrpf i mean it's a, a formidable job done already and uh, uh, in terms of an incubator, as, as Mohammed very well uh, pointed to in the beginning, back in 2011, we had the three dimensions that needed to be integrated. Uh, and if you read the 2030 Agenda document very carefully, the, that lists actually nine different elements to be uh, now uh, integrated to achieve the transformative change. And if this has not been raised also in a political context that the UN is doing, I don't think countries around the world would have been thinking about that. This is transported down to uh, to regions, and I think uh, the regional element has come become stronger. And we need to also enhance the regional input. These regional meetings can actually be also functioning as preparatory meetings, going to a council in much larger to much larger extent than they are today. Um, uh, if we look at the CSD, at the beginning of CSD, the regional input was important. At the end, it was ignored. And we, we must that, uh, not let that happen again. And, and the regional in, uh, re reporting into HLPF does not have enough space today, I think. Um, I think Mariana is correct in pointing to the fact that there is a conflict between traditional development and sustainable development issues. A brilliant report written by UNDESA last year actually said what I used in my presentation that uh, sustainable development has all has finally become politically legitimate. But they also say that there is still a conflict between traditional development thinking and the integration of the elements into uh, a tr transformative sustainable change and a change on sustainable development. This is a, a, a very, very uh, serious challenge. And uh, finally, uh, I don't think that uh, any other element 
uh, have pe has penetrated the entire system the way that the, the uh, sustainable development, the SDGs have. Uh, you can compare it to the convention, some of the key conventions that the UN and the delegates uh, have come up with that have made a thorough impact, not only on the UN, but on the world itself. And you have to compare, you have to go to the conventions, huge important conventions to find the same kind of impact as the SDGs have had and, and still have. And this is something that we need to harness and build stronger. And that's why I believe that institutions uh, have a very important and significant role to play. And as I said, I hope the last box of Pandora's uh, assemblage, the box of hope. So uh, just to, for those perhaps who weren't involved in the uh, development of the SDGs, um, just to remind them that in fact there was a battle between those who wanted sustainable development goals for all countries and the development community who wanted an MDG plus. And it really wasn't resolved till after the SDGs uh, open working group process had finished and it was clear that we had gone for, a, a, for an agenda. I think Save the Children Fund were arguing against the SDGs right up to the last negotiations. Uh, many of the development agencies in the donor community were not in, on board. So that's going to be, a, uh, has been and will continue to be an ongoing pressure. Just a couple of things on the regional stuff. One of the very interesting things that's happened with the UN Economic Commission for Europe, which is now a coalition of all the regional commissions, is developing principles for PPPs, for Sustainable Development Goals. So the UNECE has developed them, now all the other regional commissions are going to develop with their stakeholders sets of principles to help PPPs. I'm not a huge supporter of PPPs, but they're going to happen and they're going to play a role. It's better that they're linked to the, to the SDGs. And I would just Reiterate something that uh, Paolo said. UNDP is in the process of creating uh, investment forums for the SDGs in developing countries through platforms. That again needs to have a set of principles behind it to underpin it. The Secretary General has set up this um, global alliance of, of investors as a way of trying to move the investment uh, community as a whole to support the SDGs. And I think that's that's really good. We're going to have one more set of questions and then we'll, we'll have to close. So just uh, pulling some of them out. Uh, Gabriella asked uh, about the fragmentation of the UN system. You know, how do you deal with the UN systems of funds, programs and agencies? Are they linking up enough to the SDG agenda? And is that reflected in the same way in, in government ministries so that there can be a more coherent approach? Uh, the second one is from Krishnan. Um, about the Urban uh, Economic Forum. He's arguing um, about um, it's important for all branches of government, stakeholders and international community engaged in ensuring interlinkages along all of the SDGs for their implementation. Am I right to assume, however, the role of cities and local communities is often not emphasized enough? If there is there a need for a national and intergovernmental me mechanism for this? So I'll let you answer that, but there is actually a local government forum happening now as we are speaking. So I think that there is an attempt to do that. And then um, I guess the, uh, the final one um, would be uh, from uh, Bong, who says, all action is, lo is local. How could a new SDG coordinating body enable local players, incubators, accelerators, tech transfer uh, networks, investment communities, to be better integrated into the SDGs. And that might be more of a national level through your uh, VNRs or it might be through regional, but I'll leave it to the speakers to come in. So maybe uh, start with uh, Mohammed and then we'll go backwards. So your final comments as well, anything else you want to say, Mohammed? Uh, well, my, my final comment is that uh, I believe uh, while we're uh, taking into consideration the lessons of the past, uh, we all acknowledge that there are shortcomings with the, how the HLPF is undertaking its, its, its role nowadays, there are challenges, and this is why there is a review uh, going on. So I think it, it, it's a fact. 
the thing is, I believe that at this stage, we need really to take into consideration um, the issue of uh, connecting to the countries, connecting to the ground, how whatever what we are suggesting is going to impact people's lives and really uh, lead to a change on the country level and how this is fitting with what the whole UN is doing. Uh, I mean, the um, uh, development system reform and all the, the current changes that are ongoing in, in the UN. Uh, this need to be uh, fitting in as well. Uh, before I ask Jan Gustav to come in, I don't know whether, Charles, you could copy all of the questions from the Q&A into a file, because I think once we turn this off, we will lose uh, those. And where we can, we'll come back to people with some form of response uh, yeah. to what you've done. Uh, Jan Gustav. Well, um, thank you. Thank you, Felix. You can hear me. Yes. Um, uh, a quick word on the fragmentation of the UN system. I think this is something that uh, we often hear. Uh, and uh, it's been said so often in critical reviews that we have come to believe that this is a huge phenomenon. I've gone through, uh, before this, uh, this presentation and today's uh, side event, I went through uh, uh, all, the, all the specialized agencies and few of the most important uh, uh, subsidiary committees to see if they have taken on the SDGs. And, and as I said, it's a huge success story because every, every specialized agency today are trying to incorporate the SDGs and, and upgrade their plan of actions to fit into the SDGs. So, you know, the fragmentation may be, uh, may it, it, the UN system may look fragmented, but it is actually coming together in an incredibly impressive way over the SDGs. But I do believe that a council could have the power, a political power to, to actually um, make that uh, integration even, even bigger. But, but you, need, you need an institution within the UN system with a political clout and not a forum that some countries would like to reduce to a platform. Um, I think the urban issue and the municipalities is extremely important. Paula talked about that in her intervention uh, or response on, on the local issues. And I, I can direct all of those who are interested in the local and, and the municipal issues and the urban issues to a brilliant report we've written uh, by UNDESA, uh, authored and, and, and uh, edit, uh, as the editor, David Leblanc, inside that system, actually two once the last one came out last, last year, talking about this integration and the challenges. And this is also where UNDESA says that, uh, that sustainable development has reached political legitimacy, but it's not there yet. And I think in, in terms of getting the, the national activities into the UN system can come two ways. One is what you've already mentioned, the partnership issue, because every paragraph in the 2030 agenda refers to the partnership, the complete integration of the private sector, of, of the non-state stakeholder civil society and the authorities to be together there. And I think these are huge challenges on, on each of the, of the elements. And I think on a national level, a, a number of countries have, have established councils for for, for sustainable strategies. And they can work through these councils also uh, from civil society, stakeholders, private sector, et cetera, through these national councils, if they are in the countries, and then into, into, the, into the UN system that way in reporting. And finally, I think you mentioned it yourself, Felix, I think one of the big challenges are the systemic challenges. And again, the ideas coming through an incubator at the UN challenges the, the systemic issues and the financial issues. Getting this global economy into a green economy is, is extremely important. And uh, um, we're on our way, but we're not there yet. And, uh, and uh, we need to be impatient and uh, just fulfill all the, the resolutions that we've made so far and we'll be home soon. Thank you. Uh, Albert, if you want to unmute yourself, if you've got any final uh, comments or thoughts or answers to those questions. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. No. Yes. yes. You can. Ah, okay. Good. So, um, okay. So let me come in uh, unconventionally. And uh, 
you, you may excuse me that I'm not really involved in, directly in the UN systems right now. So what I'm trying to bring on board is uh, to relate on what is happening on the ground and com uh, in relation to what is happening and the talk you are trying to give, excellent talk you are trying to give. So um, when I look at the, the time I spend involving, for example, look at the NDCs we are trying to develop for countries. The building up of NC uh, NDCs, uh, the, when you look at it, trying to come up with uh, uh, greenhouse gases emission reductions, you are really touching at, at several uh, sectors that touch the lives of the people and try to address all these SDGs when you look at that. But when you look at it closely, countries are busy piling up these uh, reports and initiatives into a report. We, where does this report go? To you and uh, to proceed. Uh, if, and uh, once the report is available, uh, the country sits back happy and say, we have done, that is a milestone. So where this organization, an agency like this, would bring a really lot of value, it's to have somebody somewhere who comes and follow up the accountability. You have indicated that uh, in the area of water supply or health, or agriculture or forestry, all of which contribute to, to this, where are you in terms of the targets you have given to yourself? And everything that's done, when you look at it closely, it's linked to uh, all these SDGs. Where are you, how far? That provides the motivation, that provides kind of a constructive competition among peers, that uh, creates a situation of accountability to countries, and this is where I see really the much more importance of having an organization like the council, uh, an institution like the council that will be able to follow up, hold the hand, guide, ask, ask follow up accountability, not a punitive accountability, but to make countries aware of what is happening. Because I can tell you what you see in the reports these countries send out and what is happening in the ground in terms of the actions, it's different. I mean, ju just a small thing on, on that, because I just reflect on the first five years of the Commission on Sustainable Development. The equivalent secretariat um, provided a lot of technical assistance to governments um, who were trying to implement Agenda 21, establish councils, develop indicators. Now, some of that is being done by different bits of the UN system now, but there's still a, a gap, I think, in technical assistance and so there's a bit of a mapping exercise i think that needs to be done on who's doing what and where and see what is missing but i'm going to let Mar marianne have the nearly uh, ultimate word because i will do a, a thank you note but you've got uh, the floor marianne right so let me pick up the one on the fragmentation in the un system um of course, I mean, I think we all agree that we deal with systemic challenges and that the 2030 agenda promised a great transformation uh, towards sustainable development. And so we need to overcome fragmentation. At the same time, we want a meaningful division of labor uh, also for, you know, to, to still have an effective system. Uh, people that take care of the of the individual issues. So to have policy coherence for sustainable development is key. But of course, this is also ultimately the most difficult thing to achieve. Um, integrated policy action, relevant policy action, including financing. And here the politics come in again, right? All these turf battles around mandates, resources for staff and, and, and other things. Um, so this is definitely difficult. But the good news is to end on a positive note, which is not really a good news, uh, but we can turn it into a good news. The HLPF review has been postponed to the next General Assembly. So we have another year starting in September 2020 all the way through 21 and some other person in the chat box asks who are those countries who are willing to support um, you know larger reforms and uh, it has been the EU it has been the usual suspects the Nordics and Switzerland but I have to say they are not so far willing to invest in anything additional 
because then, of course, also the, this would have to go to the fifth committee in the General Assembly and then the finance ministers will kill it. So when we go ahead, we'll have to think about cost effective uh, options as well, making things lean but effective. So good luck for all of us with that. So, so um, I'll just make just one final uh, comment. Let, let's just remember that actually the leadership for all of this came not from the Nordics or the European Union or the US, it came from developing countries. Without Brazil, without um, the work of Maria Velotti in the, in the mission in New York, who's now the chief of staff for the secretary general, we would never have got Rio plus 20 without the enormous energy of Paulo and the government of Colombia and Guatemala and Peru um, fighting tooth and nail against lots of people the SDGs would never have happened. And more recently, the work of Nigeria in getting a sustainable investment resolution in the General Assembly, a three-year work to try and get, uh, in a sense, a space in the GA where we can discuss norms and standards for moving the investment uh, portfolio towards sustainable development. So I don't look to the Nordics for leadership. I'm looking to the developing countries because that's where the leadership in the last 10 the 15 years has come. And so we need uh, the new Mohammeds and the new Paulus to take us forward. I'd like to end this by thanking um, our two presenters and our three respondents. I think it's been a really interesting um, presentation. And I think uh, hopefully given you all food for, po food for thought, and it's great to be one of the first pop-up side event to have ever existed uh, in the uh, virtual HLPR. And we will be looking at other opportunities to do pop-up events, I'm sure, in the future. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all the participants who have uh, come and listened. And, and this is the beginning of a conversation. We'll try and produce something out of this and see if this um, has any legs. The, the, the reality is that, as Marianne said at the end, it, because this has been postponed as a conversation, then we have a year to, or over a year to work on it. Just imagine if it hadn't, none of us would have been doing anything about uh, this issue. And we have to thank Mohammed and many of the member states who managed to put into the resolution the requirement that we would review uh, fit for purpose, because without that, we wouldn't be where we are. So thank you to Charles also for giving us a logistic uh, support. And I wish all of you a great day and uh, a successful high-level political forum. Thank you very much.